Hey everyone, this is uh, Ahmed Farag. I'm one of the uh, PGY4s at the University of Kentucky. Uh, Tommy Ann and I are the communications co-chairs and we kind of uh, help guide these webinars. Today we have a really, really awesome webinar um, with a lot of uh, future RFS, or sorry, past and uh, current RFS heads and uh, Dr. B of course. So um, I'm gonna hand it over to Sedant here to kind of give introductions and uh, we'll go from there. Sedant, it's your show. Siddhant, we cannot hear you, I think. Oh, can you hear me now? Sorry about that. Yeah, we can hear you now. I'll start, sorry, I'll start yes. from the beginning. Hey guys, my name is Siddhant. I'm the current chair of the MSC uh, Reserves, and uh, uh, as many of you may know, and thank you so much for coming to this webinar. Um, Nikki's in the middle of, uh, Dr. Keith is in the middle of a pretty intense day today, so we'll start quickly with introductions and I'll go through our panelists. So I'll start off with Dr. Keith. Uh, She's a PGY6 fellow right now. It's just the last year of her fellowship at UVA uh, in the clinical IR pathway, uh, which is the precursor to IR residency. She's served as general chair of the MSC in the past and uh, recruitment chair of the RFS. Uh, for the future, she's accepted a, a private practice job in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, following graduation and fellowship. Uh, we also have Dr. Rakesh Ahuja with us. He's currently an I, uh, integrated residence floor uh, and chief resident at the IRDR uh, pathway at Einstein Medical Center. Uh, he's planning on pursuing an additional year of pediatric IR fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital after graduation. And he currently serves as the SIR RFS governing council chair for this academic year. Um, we also have Dr. Uh, Consagra with us, who's a PGY5 integrated IR resident at Kaiser Wissler. Uh, he has special interests in PAD, but truthfully all things IR. And then we also have Dr. Devalapali, who's, uh, who's right now a private practice interventional radiologist who's two, year out, two years out of training. He did his uh, diagnostic radiology residency at UCSF and interventional, radio, and interventional fellowship at UNC. Um, so without much further ado, we'll get the webinar on the road. Thanks. And I also forgot to mention, we have Dr. Vedic and Cherry as well, who's the who's the program director at Kaiser Vista as well as the RFS chair. Dr. V, I'll uh, hand it off to you. Okay, great. No, I'm uh, very honored to be with this distinguished panel. Um, three uh, RFS governing council chairs, one current, two prior, Shantanu and Nikki Keefe, and uh, former medical student council head, Nikki Keefe as well. and. Um, a couple of students have rotated with me, Nikki and uh, Karthik, and Karthik <laughs> unfortunately hasn't been able to kind of catch up to Nikki yet, so we'll see. But uh, and a couple of distinguished authors, so we'll talk about that too. A couple of uh, you know, public, you know, big uh, during residency, they wrote some IR textbooks, so it's very exciting um, and an honor and a privilege for me to be talking to this group. So. Uh, I know Nikki's getting, they're getting pretty busy and slammed with some pretty serious uh, urgent cases at UVA. So we want to get her back to um, taking care of patients. So it was uh, Dr. Kajo was kind enough to allow her a little bit of time to uh, be on this conference call, realizing how important it was to me and to um, to our group of students and residents for her to speak. So Nikki, I, I, um, I'm glad that you were able to call in. And we're going to talk about for a, few, a few things. One is you were kind of an early adapter to this whole kind of IR rotation before they began uh, becoming kind of a, almost a mandatory requirement. So I want to know kind of, you know, how what you look for in an MS4 rotation. How did you approach it? What other rotations would you recommend fourth year medical students take to prepare you for uh, uh, training in IR as a resident and afterwards? And what kind of skills? Should they acquire both clinical and technical during that time period of that fourth year? Um, so I did, as a fourth year med student, I did a total of three rotations in IR. I did one at my home institution, um, which gives you kind of the, um, the groundwork for wherever you are looking to go. And then I tried to do two rotations at other institutions, both places that I was very interested in going, but also to give me a different uh, view of IR. So everyone's institution is going to be a little bit different. Um, whether you have like a great institution, um, like where I am right now, UVA, or you know any of the institutions that people are at uh, that are talking today, um, or if you have a place that doesn't do as uh, crazy of IR as some of the bigger institutions, you know those you still want to see the bread and butter. 
then use those rotations that you do as a fourth year uh, student in order to go out and see other things. So you can go somewhere that's heavy in IO. You can go places that uh, are, uh, do a lot of aortic or PAD work. Um, you really kind of want to see the spectrum of IR because your practice that you go out into after training is going to be different uh, depending on what you want to do. And so you want to make sure that you like the bread and butter of IR as well as kind of the entire gamut. Um, Oh, that was a lot of questions. I don't remember everything. Sorry, that you no, I'll continue. So, like, uh, what kind of uh, you? We already talked about what you look for in a, in a rotation, but also what kind of skill set, whether clinical or technical, did you try to derive from your various IR blocks? So, I think in the very beginning, I uh, I wanted to learn the basic skills. You want to learn how to be a tech. Uh, being a tech is one of the uh, fundamental things of being an IR, learning how to use all of the tools and the devices. But you know that that's a great foundation, but you need to learn all of the clinical skills as well. You need to learn how to manage your patient pre and post procedurally. Um, so when your patient goes to the ICU afterwards, you need to be comfortable uh, taking care of them and you know understanding what all of the ICU doctors are talking about, the drips, the the uh, the peep, all of those different things, you need to understand all of that. And so those are great things to learn when you're a med student. Um, doing a rotation in the ICU is one of those other rotations that I would recommend in your fourth year. Um, also a rotation in vascular surgery would be uh, useful um, in med school in order to kind of, you know, if, you're, if the place that you're rotating at doesn't have a lot of aortic or PAD work, you'll get all of that uh, during a vascular surgery rotation. Um, but you really kind of want to, hone in on your skills, learn the gamut of IR, make sure that it's what you like, and um, kind of set yourself up to hit the ground running when you become an intern and into residency. So if I could summarize, you kind of want to go to a few programs to kind of get a variable experience in interventional because there's a lot of uh, kind of vari variations of, in different training programs. Two is you want to know and be very comfortable at the back table and knowing what the the technologists and scrub uh, can do and really know how to prep and drape the patient to getting the equipment ready to the contrast, the saline, et cetera. So knowing the, how to kind of loop the wire, so on and so forth. So before you can even do invasive procedures, that, that component's important. And then finally, you wanna make sure you have uh, both the, uh, acquire both clinical and technical skills. And the clinical skills arguably are more important than sometimes than the technical skills that you can acquire during fourth year. And that includes doing vascular surgery and intensive care rotations to really kind of, you know, cover all bases. Now, Nikki, um, we, we're well aware that UVA, and, and certainly I've borrowed that UVA clinical pathway model that Dr. Matsumoto uh, enlightened me about to help build our own program. Um, and I, know, I feel like it's one of the more you know, one of the better programs, arguably better than the traditional integrated program uh, that's currently available. Now, can you tell me a little bit about, I know we've talked about this, but your vascular surgery integration, when you did it, why, uh, and how you did it, and, and how it's benefited you? So, as I mentioned, vascular surgery as a med student is a really important rotation, but we stress a lot of vascular surgery here as well. Um, you know, we do a lot of joint cases with vascular surgery. I just did a case yesterday for a T-bar for an aortobronchial fistula. Um, and honing that relationship with vascular surgery, as well as all of the other colleagues, uh, clinical colleagues that you work with, you know, the dialysis surgeons, the hepatobiliary doctors, uh, the GI luminal doctors, all of those is extremely important throughout all of your training. Um, when it comes to vascular in particular, we do a minimum of two months as an intern. So I did actually almost four months as an intern, just happened to be my schedule that way. And then we do an additional two months of vascular surgery in your PGY three year. So as an R2, we do an additional two months. Um, we do our ICU month in your PGY two year as an R1, and we rotate in the SICU. Uh, and we also take care of all of the vascular surgery patients there. The T bars and E bars, all of our post op patients go to the SICU afterwards. So you really have a lot of time throughout residency to learn how to manage these patients. Um, I find that uh, the vascular surgery patients in particular are the ones that um, are extremely important for. Uh, your education, because not only are you managing the procedural aspect, but you're learning how to care for um, the patients that are bleeding. Uh, learning how to take care of patients in the MICU is great during your training, but you need to learn how to take care of the bleeding patients, because those are the patients that come to IR. Um, <clears throat> shoot, what was I going to say? I can't remember. Keep going. 
No, that's fair. So from what I can summarize is basically, if you look at kind of the current kind of paradigm, it's usually one month of IR, which is mostly procedural, the PGY2, second year, third year, and fourth year. So about three months in those three years. But you're gaining quite a bit of both ICU, vascular surgery uh, experience during those first three years after internship. One of the, the great things is you learn how to work up all these vascular surgery patients. So you'll see a patient in clinic or, you know, when you're working them up for a pick line and you're doing a pick for osteo and you're like, oh, does that patient have PAD? Is that why they got their osteo? And you're wrecking up business that way. You're doing um, a first dialysis line for someone who uh, is initiating their dialysis that, you know, is new and they think it's going to be for a while. And you're like, hmm, is that patient a candidate for an uh, endovascular AV fistula creation? Does that patient have PAD related to their uh, end stage renal disease? So it's like, it's really teaching you when you do that with vascular surgery clinic patients that all of these things go together and how you can help rack up business for your practice when you move forward. But I mean, your residency and stuff will teach you that as well. Uh, but you really have to think of these patients as a whole and not just the procedure that you're doing, but all of the other things that can come with it. So, Nikki, and one of the uh, things that I've heard of a concern from some of the current integrated residents, and they're you know, there's five and six years, so they've not done ICU uh, since their internship, and then now they're five, and they just don't feel as comfortable as they're, you know, they don't, they feel like more like a medical student, um, in the sense that they they're more interpreting imaging and not as comfortable dealing with vents and pressors. And I agree with you. I think it's very important because we're dealing with very sick patients with bad heart, lungs, and livers and kidneys you know, on our table without anesthesia support. And they are often bleeding or often they're septic and uh, um, they're not the most stable patient population. And uh, how, did you, how did you feel uh, when you were managing these patients as a five or, si or currently as a six from that standpoint? Well, we do things a little differently here. We did our ICU rotation as a as an R1, as a PGY2. So I don't have that rotation when I was a, a PGY5, but we still take care of those patients here. Um, you know, it definitely was a little bit of a, a learning curve again uh, to try and remember some of that stuff. But we do IR throughout all of our residency. We have it every single year, whether I'm doing vascular surgery or IR. And so you just need to stay on top of those things. Um, and, you know, I've got my little handbook of ICU care that I just peruse through again before uh, um, before I have, you know, a patient going up there when I come back to IR. I did that when I started my mini fellowship. Um, and now, you know, I feel very comfortable taking care of these patients again because, you know, I've been on IR for almost two full years now. Wow, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Nikki, for your contributions to the webinar. I yeah, know if you've got to go, feel free. Yeah, go ahead, please. I just want to mention to anybody who's still debating IR, you know, it's Friday night and all of my co-fellows are here because we've got some awesome cases and that's what, you know, that's what I love about IR. We've got like an aorto uh, ureteral fistula. We've got a, an acute, uh, you know, phlegmasia thrombosis with a GBM that we have to do a thrombectomy. We can't even do lysis on. We've got two more of those tomorrow. We've got, you know, a pregnant lady with a perk nef. We've got the entire gamut of IR and it's just, it's super exciting. And, you know, it's like a family of people that you can rely on that like, you know, everyone's covering for me so I can be here at this conference, but uh, you know, all you have to do is call and you know, everybody's here. And that's just what I love about IR. You can't say the same about a lot of other specialties where um, everyone's willing to step up and help you out and you get to see so many cool things. So I wish you all the best of luck. And if anybody has any questions about anything, please feel free to reach out, uh, shoot me an email or text or anything. And thanks so much, Nikki. And and on top of that, you get to hang out with Minaj Kaja as your attending, um, which is yeah, always fun. I'm on call so, with him tonight, yeah. Yeah, you're lucky. So I'd, I'd hang out for with him if I could, you know, <laughs> so anyway. All right, thank you, Nikki. Okay, bye guys. Thanks, Nikki, bye. appreciate it. No problem. Um, so we had some great lessons learned from Nikki and uh, Dr. Keefe, and we'll move forward. I wanted to actually also mention that we have another panelist who is should be on on with us shortly, Dr. Verpande. He's uh, just having some technical difficult technical difficulties uh, at the current moment, but we'll we'll move forward. And when he uh, comes on, I'll be sure to introduce him and and tell him the uh, the questions we had planned for him as well. But uh, I wanted to talk to Dr. Ahuja uh, a, a little bit about the surgical internships and the value that they bring. So um, Dr. Ahuja, could you please tell us a little bit more about 
what is the value of a surgical internship? Why should medical students pursue a surgical internship versus other opportunities that they have? That's a great question. Uh, and it is, it is the question that many medical students have in mind about three options before starting the IRDR residency or any radiology with IR pathways. You have three options. You have medicine, medical internship, transitional year internship, and surgical internship. You have to think about uh, IR as the specialty, which is basically you have to be the person who's absolutely good with their hands, have expertise in managing the patients, not just doing the procedures, but actually managing the patients clinically. Uh, honestly, if you cannot manage the patients clinically, you probably will not have a stand in the, uh, in the treatment and algorithms, developing algorithms for these patients. So with that being said, you can just think about IR as a surgical specialty just with more technical finesse and having the same amount of clinical knowledge as every other surgeon can have. You want to own the patients right from seeing them in the clinic, consults, doing the procedures, follow up, be it PAD patients, you might have to follow up for them for a very, very long time. So that's what surgical res uh, internship uh, teaches you how the patients present from start to end, including doing the procedure. So in my mind, all I would really say surgical internship with the expertise of having surgical internship and then doing this residency just makes you a complete doctor. Like you are responsible from start to end, including procedures, which is not, which is, it's a major part, but everything else also plays a very important role in managing the patients from start to end. Uh, does that answer your question? Absolutely. And uh, I want to really quickly also, and thank you, Dr. Ahuja, for that. I also wanted to quickly point out, you have Dr. Verpande as well. Uh, and since I wasn't able to introduce him in the beginning, uh, I'd just like to give a quick rundown. Dr. Verpande is a PGY4 at uh, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, he did a surgical intern year at Pittsburgh. Uh, he's passionate about medical education. He has published a pocketbook of clinical IR in 2019, which helps a lot of medical students on their away rotations and their sub eyes. Um, and he's also previously served as the governing council chair of the RFS. Dr. Verpande, thank you for coming on. And I'm glad we were able to sort out the technical difficulties. I'd like to ask you that same question, um, you know, that I asked Dr. Ahuja is, could you talk to us, you know, with your experience in education and training, uh, what more, uh, could you talk to us a little bit about the surgical internships and what skills uh, one can expect to gain or one should hope to gain and how that contributes overall to the IR residency and, and the experience the residents have going forward. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, so thanks for having me here. Um, the, I think the, the, before I get into my kind of spiel, I'll, I'll say that if, if you know me, I'm, I'm very, uh, uh, I have a very strong opinion about this. So um, the, the thing that I'd like to start off by saying is that I think when you're going into IR as a medical student, um, you got to remember that you're, you're walking into a specialty that is still being molded and formed. So uh, you got to go into the mindset of knowing that, that you got to look at the specialties that have already been uh, around for a long time, that have already evolved and, and have matured. And we got to take what they have to offer and, and bring to our specialty. So, and that's one of the most exciting thing uh, about IR is, is that we have the ability and, and the chance to build a specialty. Um, so with that in mind, I'll, I'll I love surgery and I think uh, a lot of the med students who I've talked to and, and I'm sure who are on the call right now uh, love surgery as well. But I think that there's things that IR offers which are um, superior to what surgery offers. And I, I, I don't wanna get into too much of that, but the surgical intern year um, is, is incredibly important for, when, for your training and, and for how you wanna mold yourself. So. There's some overt benefits of a surgery intern year over a medicine year or, or even a transitional year. There's some overt benefits and then there's some less obvious benefits that I think I've uh, gleaned that, that I kind of learned about years later. Uh, so the overt benefits are, are obvious, right? So there's procedures. So my experience, I did a, a ton of procedures in, in for everything from bronchoscopies to EGDs to uh, you know, laparoscopic coles and, and gallbladder removals and line placements. And so things that are, are very, very, uh, not in the ballpark of IR, but still it teaches you to do. It teaches you to kind of get your hands dirty and, and get that procedural confidence. Um, the focus is on doing in surgery and le there's less time in rounding. And, and while I don't want to say that there's not value in rounding, there's definitely a lot of benefits to rounding. 
Um, I think in surgery, much like an IR, you do a lot. And uh, in surgery intern, your, your, your focus is on doing and acting, um, which is huge. I think that's, that teaches you from the get-go to be a go-getter and be self-reliant. And you know, if there's something that needs to be done, just go to the supply closet, grab the material and get it done yourself. Um, next, you have more interaction to specialty that IRs closes to. And, and without, a, without make, make no mistake here that IR is very similar to surgery. And anyone that tells you otherwise is, is flat out wrong. IR is essentially a surgical subspecialty and it's, I think people are treating it as such. Um, the, the specialty that refers most to IR is usually surgery, some sort of a surgical subspecialty. So keeping that in mind, it's good to know um, what a surgeon, how a surgeon thinks. And, and frankly, how we can take that mentality and mindset and bring it to IR. Um, the, and, and that's, that's, you're immersed in that, in, around those people for a full year in surgery. And, and, you know, I've heard the argument for transitional year to be that, you know, you can do medicine, you can do surgery. The problem is when you're doing that, you, you're sort of half in, half out. Um, you need to be full in the surgery. You gotta immerse yourself in that environment for that entire year to be, um, to be, to feel like you're one of theirs. Um, and you're not going to get that if you do just a month or two here and there. Um, another over benefit is that surgery is, is sort of the most evolved, uh, general surgery is one of the most evolved form of residencies out there. And IR can learn a lot from them. I, and I think there's a ton that we can learn in terms of how to behave in the, in the wards and, uh, how to wield your skills with poise and confidence and apply them with your clinical knowledge. Um, IR have a unique skill set, and I think when you look at the surgeons and how they market themselves to people on the wards and um, how they interact with the, the referrers, that's something that I, I've I like to think that I've kind of adopted that. And uh, you can only get that by doing a surgery year. And finally, the, one of the big over things is the the stamina and the endurance. Uh, you know, surgical intern years hard. It's it's not easy. It's long hours and um, and, and frankly, so is IR. So you got to get ready and you got to be prepared to put in those hours. So doing a surgical intern year is, is going to build that stamina endurance. Um, there are some less obvious benefits that I think I, I didn't even realize that I'd gotten out of a surgical intern year, but it's, it's now, you know, three, four years later that I'm kind of realizing that I've, I've gotten that. Um, you, you learn, I think I've learned when I'm talking to surgeons, how they behave and how they act you get that insight in your intern year. And it makes me a better diagnostic radiologist. And then for sure, I think it's gonna make me a good interventional radiologist. Next, I think confidence. If there's a very palpable difference in um, people coming out of a surgical intern year, they're just confident. You are procedurally, clinically, and technically, uh, I think more confident than anyone else um, coming out of a, a prelim year. And that stems from the fact that the surgical intern is tossed in the frying pan uh, from day one. In my, you know, my, my experience from my intern year, on, on my first day, I did an escarotomy. On my, on my first week, I was running a trauma. In my, you know, first month, I was doing a lap coli. So you, you're, you're expect, a lot is expected from you. And I think that's important. Um, you're not coddled, you're not babied, and uh, you're expected to come ready to work from day one. And, and that builds these incredibly valuable skills that um, I think I've, I've taken away from my intern year. Um, and finally, I'll kind of just, I'll leave, I'll leave y'all with this. Um, after my surgical intern year, it, I truly feel like I can handle anything as far as uh, workload goes. You know, I, I was putting in easily 80, 90 hours a week on non-call weeks on my surgery year. And while that sounds really rough, it flew by, that year flew by. So do not let the intensity of a surgical intern year, um, you know, sway you away quite the opposite embrace that embrace that because that's going to make you a um a heck of an interventionalist when when you get to that point well thank you so much for that those are excellent points uh dr Ramponte, and thank uh, very Ponte, and thank you so much dr huja as well i guess i wanted to just continue a little bit on both what both of you touched on especially in the surgical intern year if we wanted to get a head start to be prepared as medical students or as future ir trainees what courses uh, do you think M4s and M3s should elect to take? You know, we were given an option of elective. So what, what courses do you think would help us uh, even get ready for a surgical year, uh, surgical intern year, if you choose, you know, obviously if you choose to take that and 
will really help us on our journey towards uh, becoming, a, becoming a great interventional radiologist. And I'll start with you, Dr. Verpande. Uh, what would be your thoughts on that? Sure. So I, I think uh, um, in the last couple of years, we have been pushing a lot of med students to um, have an intense fourth year of med school. And, and there's a couple of reasons for that. The first reason is that you're going to, after your surgical intern year is over, assuming you do a surgical intern year, you're going to spend three years in, in diagnostic radiology where you are going to, whether or not you like it, you're going to lose a little bit of your clinical skills. And so knowing that you need to come into your intern year at a much higher level, assuming that you're going to lose a little bit of that knowledge, the clinical skills. So you got to walk in far superior to the rest of your colleagues. So with that in mind, you should shoot for um, as intense of a fourth year as you can. And IR is unique in that we are dealing with specialties. Um, we have pathology that sort of spans the entire body. So, you know, you should do a surgical oncology month. You should do a vascular surgery month, ICU month. These are all very helpful rotations to get you ready for intern year and, and your future. Um, I think that Dr. Dr. V would agree with this, that, that the more, and that's also very helpful on your applications, by the way, program directors definitely notice it. It's something that I look at when I'm looking at applications as well. So definitely pay attention to, um, your schedule in fourth year and, and, you know, try to, try to complete your education with as many surgical rotations, IC rotations as you can. Well, thank you. That's a that's 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 a great response and and very informative and educational. Um, Dr. Ahuja, I guess my question to you. I know you've worked with a lot of medical students as well. Is when we take these uh, surgical cores, um, what skills uh, should we really try to hone in on and and try to try to master before starting surgical year in residency? So besides uh, the technical prowess that uh, Shantanu already talked about, and Dr. V keeps men mentioning all the time, uh, which is just listen to what exactly all these people say. You have to have technical progress, which will be provided to you regardless uh, whether you are on first week or you're on your last week of surgical internship. The most important thing you need to know is ICU. When you rotate through ICU, surgical internship does teach you how to get down into the mud and manage these patients, the pressors, uh, managing the vent, knowing how to manage the shock, how to manage even in neuro ICU for that matter. For in our in our program, the neuro ICU and surgical ICU are together. So basically, we are able to manage both of them. Believe it or not, there is so many instances during this uh, IRDR residency that uh, I have been personally. I, I thought this is the amazing time of my life is because I am able to manage these patients because someday before I had managed these patients in the ICU before. And seeing the trauma, how patients bleed out, how to manage uh, the, how do you replace the products? How do you measure tag? How do you read it? The, everything is taught in the surgical residency. Yes, medical uh, residency is great, but uh, I personally believe, and I echo what Shantanu already said, I have a very, very strong feeling that doing the uh, surgical re uh, internship prepares you to be one of the most stellar residents in your IR residency. Awesome. Thank you so much for the feedback to Dr. Hujan. Thank you, Dr. Varpande. I'm actually going to now hand it off to Dr. V, who um, is going to continue the discussion from here on. Uh, thank you. So, Rocky, you kind of stole my thunder a little bit. My next question really was going to be to uh, Shantanu uh, as well. You know, so Shantanu, you had the foresight and kind of gave me some uh, ideas about really getting that ICU service line going and, and it made me realize how important it is because as uh, I said earlier, we're dealing with patients with bad heart ejection fractions and aortic stenosis and uh, significant liver dysfunction and end stage renal disease, maybe with you know severe COPD or pulmonary dysfunction and we're asked to treat them and without anesthesia support. Um, many of these patients could be septic uh, on pressors or recurring high complex vent settings. Uh, could be bleeding, as uh, Rocky had said, you know, with the requirements of mass transfusion protocols or pressors as we're doing these life-saving uh, procedures, whether it be uh, epistaxis or hematemesis or GI bleed or ruptured aneurysm, um, stroke work, all these will require a lot of physiologic uh, manipulation. So, Shantanu, tell me um, kind of your thoughts on this. And how can both students and really residents 
um, optimize their ICU training during residency? And how would you, if you could have the ideal IR training pathway, how would you integrate ICU into your six-year training program or seven-year sure. training program? Sure. So uh, before I, I used to, when, when Dr. V and I kind of came up with this idea of IC, the importance of ICU, we got a lot of weird looks. I remember a lot of meds. It was a hard sell for a while. And it took me a while to figure out why I, why I thought that ICU was so important for, for interventional radiology training. Um, and I'll tell you a little story before I jump into to Dr. V's uh, questions. And this was um, end of my fourth year and I was on an IR sub I and are in the beginning of my fourth year as an IR sub I and we had a patient down in IR who um, who was who was you know just came down with the ICU nurse that was it just the ICU nurse and he was uh, wildly sick you know he was on two pressers he was septic kind of the situation Dr. V was describing and he he crashed on the angio suite and it was a moment of sort of panic for everyone in IR in the IR suite and it was a shock to me to kind of see the overall uh, response to this condition. It, it was a emergent situation and uh, it was a lot of deer and headlights around, around me. So I remember that experience and that sort of shaped my overall belief on why I think ICU is so important for IR or for IR trainees. Um, the, the, there's one thing that Dr. V mentioned that's incredibly, incredibly important, which is we're getting a lot of sick patients down to IR. We're getting a lot of sick patients and these patients are coming down with just a nurse usually. They don't have, uh, unlike a urologist or an orthopedic surgeon, we don't have the benefit of having an anesthesiologist coming down to take care of all their vitals and all their pressors and vent requirements. It sometimes falls on us. And there's been many, many cases since then that if you pay attention, you will notice a crumping patient on your table. And if you can act accordingly and act early enough where you can avoid them kind of going downhill. So you are essentially functioning as a uh, sort of a baby anesthesiologist. I mean, say what you will, but I, I truly believe that. And um, the ICU experience is one of the only times in, in your training, you're going to be around sick patients day in and day out from, you know, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. or whatever. And you're going to deal with a lot of these issues that we want, that we will be dealing with as IR. So um, the, the way that it is set up right now. You have just one month in your uh, PGY-5 year, your ESIR, your, your independent or inter integrated IR year. In your PGY-5 year, you'll do a single month of ICU. That's the requirement. I don't think that's enough. I think that there, there should be, that one month is not enough to sort of glean what you need to glean. Um, so I've set it up so that I'm doing two straight months. So I, I think that's one way you could do it is to do two straight months. You need one month just to kind of get your feet wet, get a feel for how to um, you know, how to handle these patients. And the second month is when you kind of really capitalize on these skills you've, you've gained in the first month. Um, that's not the only way you could do it. You can, you can do it in many different ways. You could spread it out. I know uh, Karthik uh, Consagra has spread it out, spread out his IC experience throughout his residency, which is, in my opinion, ideal. I think you need to spread it out throughout your uh, residency. But I know that, you know, sometimes flexibility is an issue with, with schedules. So, I'll leave you guys with this. You need to make sure you get a good critical care exposure. Um, no one is expecting you to be intensivist, but you absolutely should be able to handle critically ill patients. And the, the goal is, is very clear, which is that when you're rounding or when you have patients down in the IR suite and things go south, that you have a working understanding of some of the basics of ICU medicine, which is pressors, vents, um, conditions, how to run, you know, ACLS, ATLS, you got to be able to do that and it needs to be reflexive. So you can read as much as you can about these things. You can even, you know, have those little pamphlets that you carry around your white coat pocket, but nothing beats actually running these conditions and these codes on your own and in the critical care setting. So these things need to get reflexive because your patients are going to require you and not an anesthesiologist to handle these issues. Um, things that you can do to prepare. I, I think you need to have, as soon as you start your residency, you need to have a conversation with your PD. If this is something that's exciting to you, and it, and it should be, it, it, this speaks to how uh, broad IR training is, is, is that this should be exciting to, to know that you're, you're going to be functioning as almost a critical care doctor at times. Um, you need to have a, a discussion with your PD and make this known to them that this is important, that this is something that you really want. And it starts in your med four year do an ICU month in your med four year, and then, you know, your intern year, uh, if it's a surgical intern year, 
request an ICU month then. And then if you can, sometime in your PGY two to four year, um, before your PGY five year, do maybe one month in that year, in that time period. And then you'll obviously do your PGY five year ICU month. So by the end of it, you're gonna have done five, four to five months of ICU, which is uh, I think what you need to kind of get comfortable with critically ill patients. And, and I'll stop talking, but just remember, remember the story I told you. You do not wanna be that doctor in IR that is frozen when something is going downhill. You gotta be that guy that's gonna step up and, and take control of the situation and, and feel confident that what you're doing is, uh, is right. If I may add something to it, uh, if it, that's okay. Uh, Shanti okay, sure. mentioned a very important point about how uh, important it is to manage the patients uh, in the critical care units and also in the, uh, in the angio suite. But uh, given the situation at this point with the, uh, the requirements and having only one ICU a month, uh, and as he mentioned, you have to speak to your program director, there is one other thing that you can do, which is what I have been doing for a very long time. We in IR operate on so many critically ill patients. Quite a few of them actually belong to ICU. Round on them and round with the team. When they are rounding, you obviously can figure out whatever time the teams round. But if you round with the critical care doctors, you just spend like five minutes just on that patient when they're talking hear them out listen to their uh, uh the process of thinking what they exactly do what are they talking about the pressers what the what the vent requirements are what the waveforms are believe it or not just five minutes spent on that one single patient if you have that in icu and you do that over time you have three months of uh, ir during your second year one month in first one month in third one month in fourth at, uh, six months in fourth and then 12 months in fifth you do that at least for one patient every day, you're gonna be absolutely strong in managing that patient. And just the story that he, he told you about, it's funny, I was actually speaking to them yesterday, Karthik and Shantanu, I had this patient who was crashing. Uh, at the end of the day, just a perm cath placement, nothing special. He suddenly dropped his blood pressure uh, after we gave him sedation. Uh, and my junior resident was doing it. I walked inside the room where everybody was panicking. I said, call the rapid response, give him 200 of Neo right now. I want fluids right now. Hold the pressure where he's bleeding or find out what's going on and give him reversal agents, give him 0.5 of this, give him 0.4 of this. Believe it, it's, it makes a world of a difference when you have this at the tip of your fingers. You can save lives, rapid response or code, no matter what, who you call. It takes about 10 minutes, maybe, 15 minutes, but you are responsible for that patient and patients can die in that time. So it's really, really important for you to understand that. And that's what overall training teaches you. Remember five minutes per patient with the ICU team teaches you a lot. Um, yeah, I have to echo that. I think it is very important in our physiologically ill patients and patients who are bleeding and, and, and get septic with their biliary obstruction or uh, urinary obstruction, they can get, uh, they can go down south pretty quick. and they, you know, it's bailed me out multiple times in the last several years after kind of incorporating ICU uh, training and whatnot. And having just the norepinephrine drips and vasopressin and what have you in our lab and just ready to go has saved several countless lives. So I think that ICU education training is invaluable. Now, let's get to uh, Karthik. Karthik is my own resident. He was my medical student and second to Nikki Keep, who you heard talk early on and um, kind of lives in our shadows in some ways because she had done well over 23 hemobos and uh, as primary and Karthik, I think you had the second highest at 19. But um, you haven't written a textbook yet, even though Shantanu and Nikki have. So Karthik, we're expecting a textbook in the next year or so from you. But um, regardless, let me ask you this. And you know, we've talked about this before. I think the most important thing that we as doctors do and as and basis specialists do is not could we do it, because technically, yeah, we can do a lot of things, but really, should we do this uh, intervention or procedure on these patients? Now, I want to ask you this. How do you balance an acquisition of both the clinical knowledge, the ability to build your own practice and referrals, having a clinic, the technical component and challenges of doing interventions, whether it be stroke therapy or a foot revascularization or uh, liver-directed therapy or ablation, the technical component, and the complex imaging of head-to-toe 
in your six or seven year training program that you're in. How do you navigate that? You know, acquiring clinical skills, technical and imaging skills, and, and practice development skills. Yeah, so I mean, as a lot of the previous speakers, you know, are way more qualified than I am to definitely be on this panel. Um, I think, you know, one of the big things was repetition and that only kind of came with time. I had to invest a lot of extra time into my training, you know, more than my DR colleagues or even, you know, it's arguably some of my surgical colleagues. I'm working a lot more than they are to kind of learn all the points that you talked about, clinical knowledge. We implemented a daily 7 a.m. lecture series for the R residents just so on the DR months, you know, your clinical knowledge is in atrophying. We wanted to reinforce it where, you know, Dr. V, some of his other colleagues, they'll pimp us on clinical situations and you just kind of go through it. So things start to become second nature, uh, managing patients and their medical, you know, comorbidities or even the medical disease associated with your intervention. So that, you know, I think incorporating a lot of that is really important. Um, and like, the, you know, Shantanu said, and everyone said repetition, repetition, repetition to where it just becomes second nature. And, you know, I've kind of used that for the technical side of things. And when you're on DR, you know, I made it a point to try to be better than any of the other DR residents. I tried to read more, you know, read better, try to score higher, everything better than the DR people um, to try to up that game. Because, you know, I knew I'd spend less time on DR rotations, but I wanted to milk every minute of it. You know, pick the brains of the attendings constantly, ask them so many questions and say, how are you approaching this? How do you approach that? Why'd you decide that? Why'd you think to do this? You know, more so than like, why'd you use that wire? Or, you know, just like trying to figure out how they thought. Because I know they learned all that over years and I'm trying to learn that in a month. So just trying to get inside people's heads um, that are way smarter, way more experienced than I am. You know, I I kind of, you know, like the second to go, Kobe, I, I, I didn't feel the need to reinvent things. I knew all these people around me were way smarter, way more experienced than I was. All I had to do was figure out a way to get the information out of them. And that's, I think, the best way to do it. Um, you know, practice development, I was fortunate to come into a program that is very, you know, is a great practice. And I've just milked Dr. V for all of his knowledge on how to practice build and kind of trying to juggle all that at the same time. But, you know, I think it all kind of boiled down to you have to just put in the time and just repetition and do it over and over again. So it becomes second nature. And there's a lot you, you have to accomplish. But if I can do it, I think anyone, you know, that's listening in can do it. Okay. Thank you, uh, Karthik. So, a um, couple other questions I have. And one is, like, what is the, um, what, you know, you have that half a day of clinic every Friday afternoon where you see your own patients in the office setting. Uh, right now with COVID, it's on telephone visits. But how has that been helpful to you as an interventional physician? And uh, let's start off with that. And then, and if you, you know, how would you recommend other students who may not go to programs that have that implemented or residents or current residents, how would, could they go about implementing such a program during their uh, all their years of training, not only their six year, but the PGY two through six year, second through six year? Yeah, so great question. So, you know, I, <clears throat> in our program, to kind of summarize what Dr. V was saying, the integrated resident gets half a day of clinic every week, no matter the rotation you're on, whether it's on a diagnostic rotation or a clinical rotation, you get your own half day of clinic to kind of see your own patients. Um, and kind of develop a relationship with them throughout your residency and kind of practice build and do all those things that the attendings may be doing that you may not realize. Um, and that started for me my PGY4 year because that's when we kind of got approved for integrated residency. But, you know, for some of my juniors, uh, they'll begin it from two to six. But even just in this like a year and a half of having it every week, plus going to clinic with Dr. V when I was an IR ever since I was a student, you know, I've kind of really grown to appreciate clinic. And I kind of want to summarize it in like three points. One, you know, clinic to me became my home base. I stopped seeing the lab or the hospital as my home base. To me, clinic was my identity. Um, and, you know, for three reasons. One, my patients. And I call them my patients because I start to feel like they're my patients. Uh, I saw the patients before the procedures, after the procedures, and I followed them for as long as, you know, I've been doing it. And I really, that's when I was able to develop the bonds with my patients and get to know them personally, meet their family, their friends. You know, get to know their family, their friends, what they did for a living, you know, how old are their grandkids, what are they doing, where do they live, um, stuff that, you know, I think really helped kind of build this bond with my patients that made me a better interventionist from a procedure standpoint as well. You know, I could discuss their history in detail, what's been going on, and my role, and not only my role in their intervention, but the management of their entire disease. Um, I could see, you know, and really let them think about, you know, what the benefit of my, not only what the benefit of my procedure is, 
but really what the risks are because, you know, I mean, it's for a different talk altogether, but Dr. V and I sometimes talk about the ethics of, you know, getting consent, seeing the patient right before the procedure and getting consent there. And, you know, is there coercion involved? You know, and that's a whole, like I said, different talk, but not having to deal with any of that is so nice. Um, so, and it just solidified my role as a guidance counselor to my patients. And, and then the other thing that really, you know, amazed me was how much my patients actually taught me. Outpatient versus inpatient medicine is very different. The questions patients ask you are very different. You know, in the hospital, number one question I'd always get after procedures is like, oh, can I shower with this Band-Aid on? You know, and like as an outpatient, you're going to ask very different questions. So I learned the consequences, you know, of my actions or even my inactions. I learned the disease and how my role affected the process of the disease. I learned the natural history of the disease when I didn't intervene. Uh, I learned to become the gatekeeper of the actual disease and how to build a thriving practice. And, you know, that takes me to my last point, the importance of clinic is it's an absolute must if you're going to build a thriving practice. The clinic is how you get your referrals, see your referrals, talk to your referrals. Like, you know, Shantanu said, I said, you know, forward your clinic notes, show you have this discussion talking about just not only the procedure, but the disease and how you plan to follow them and guide them through it. And I also noticed when I was starting to get my own referrals, I would tell, you know, referring other clinicians be like, hey, can you just send them to my clinic? And when I would start telling people I had my own clinic and they're like, oh, you have your own clinic. I felt that I started getting taken more seriously as well. And I think that's something that, you know, we don't easily, we don't really think about, but every other clinical specialties, you know, goes to clinic. I mean, you can't even spell the word clinical or clinician without the word clinic. And, you know, it's, it's just an absolute must, I think, if you, if you really want to be a true clinical IR doctor. Now, the harder question you ask me is, you know, how to start it if it doesn't already exist at your program? And the truth is there's definitely going to be a lot of politics involved. And, you know, a lot of the people that were actually on this panel, we met last SIR to kind of discuss this and just how to implement some changes in the IR residency in general. And it was interesting to hear every program, you know, had their own set of politics that you have to deal with. And that, and that's just the truth. And that's, you know, the truth of just the nature of the job in IR in general, I think even as you become an attending, but things that I think you can e you know easily implement is if you're not going to clinic on your IR rotations, just ask to go, right? That's a quick, easy fix. You automatically get those extra weeks of IR. Um, you know, with COVID, there's a lot of telehealth going on. And so maybe when you're on diagnostic radiology and you have a certain mentor in IR, you can say, hey, do you mind even if I'm on DR, if I continue to follow these patients and maybe on nights you're on call, I could do a telephone visit while you're there with, you know, supervising me and we can go over just so I can follow these patients along with you. Because a lot of these patients, you know, that we manage, you can follow longitudinally with telephone visits. Um, and then if you want to take it to the next level, you know, discuss with your program directors, any senior residents who may know the personalities and politics a little better, how to, you know, bring it into your program and hold them kind of accountable even be like, hey, you know, other programs have this. And I personally think this is an absolute must in my IR training. And, you know, this is why X, Y, Z, and you can feel free to use any of the reasons I gave and, you know, kind of hold them accountable and be like, hey, other places are doing this. How do we have, make it happen here? Um, like, you know, going back to the politics, you may get some pushback from your diagnostic colleagues, uh, which is, you know, a reflection of what the real world is like. And what we kind of did when we set it up was we implemented uh, reading quotas and said, okay, what do you expect the diagnostic radiology residents to read on a CERM service? And we said, okay, we'll have the IR residents, you know, read one and a half times that to make up for the, if you will, the lost time. Um, so kind of, you know, compromising in that way as well. Um, and we also said that, okay, clinic, you know, as important as it is, we treat it like a privilege where if people were falling behind, we agreed that, you know, they'll be, their uh, clinic privilege will be pulled and they'd have to kind of make up, you know, that lost time some other way. And you have to also realize when you start out, it's okay to have, you know, a ghetto clinic. Uh, Dr. V will talk about how when he started, he'd walk his patients to urgent care so he can go get their vitals in between cases or in between uh, with fluorodefecography. Uh, and, you know, that's completely okay because that's what you need to do when you're starting out. And I think over time, that'll build into a, a clinical program or clinical practice that, you know, that other places may already have. So I think those are some good, easy ways to start out. Thank you. Um, Karthik, um, you know, I know we've talked about, you know, not only you, uh, two things I want to ask you. One is, you know, currently there's a one month each year of IR, you know, in the first P three years of residency or PGY 2, 3, and 4. How many months have you done and how has it helped you to this point to kind of, uh, from a technical and uh, standpoint primarily? 
So, uh, so I did my rotation, you know, two rotations with student. I did a rotation my intern year, and then I did two, basically two months my PGY two year, two months my oh, my PGY three year, and then I did a month of neuro IR, IR, PGY four, and the same thing, basically PGY five. I did two more months of neuro IR and basically spent the vast majority of PGY five doing peripheral IR. Um, I think how it's helped me is, you know, when you're in a busy place, kind of like what Dr. Keith is dealing with right now, it you you don't feel as bogged down later on by the workflow, the intensity, um, and all that, and you can really kind of just just ride the wave and hone in on your technical skills later on. Like as a PGY five, I'm not worrying about the clinical management and all that because I kind of built that skill set early on in training, and even just functioning as a resident on the service when it gets really busy kind of learned a lot of that early on so i can really fine-tune a lot of my technical skills obviously like with any procedure you know like kind of like a ten thousand hour rules you just the more time you put in the better you'll be and that i'm a firm believer of that including ir i mean i know we say you know technically a lot of our stuff is difficult and we're really you know we're we're best equipped to do it but i've seen a lot of non-irs do stuff we do very well and i think it's just a testament to the fact that they got you know their, their numbers in Perfect. Thank you. Um, and then, you know, finally, as far as you, you know, I know you graciously volunteered into the COVID ICU uh, this past, this re most recently, about a month or so ago. Um, how much, did, how comfortable did you feel in that environment and, uh, you know, from your kind of early ICU integration? And can you describe that experience? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, when the COVID thing hit, we, uh, I basically got sent home by Dr. V because there was a whole PPE shortage. We're in Los Angeles where, you know, there was an area of concern where we were trying to prevent what was happening in New York from happening here. So there's an issue with PPE, trainees scrubbing in and all this. So Dr. V said, okay, I want you to just go stay at home so that you don't get sick. And if, you know, one of the attendees gets sick, we may have to have you come in and kind of fill the void. And so I was at home for about a week. Going into my second week, I was losing my mind. I could not stay at home. And so I volunteered to go help on the COVID ICU, do the exact opposite of probably what he wanted me to do in terms of staying away from the virus. But the months of ICU I had done before, you know, kind of throughout residency, as Shantanu said, made me feel very comfortable going into that role kind of just the next day. I told him, you know, let me know when you need me, I'm ready to go. And that really helped me in terms of event management. I had a, a good base on event management. And a lot of these people are tricky with the COVID because it's very complex disease and not a typical arts type situation, but I could, you know, just build on my base of event management. And because I wasn't kind of learning how to function as an ICU resident, because I already knew all that since I had done it throughout residency, kind of going back to, like I said, PGY5 IR, I already knew how to function. So now I could really start to fine tune or, you know, build some more advanced kind of knowledge on, on advanced topics. And I mean, the, the experience was very humbling. You know, I, I have a lot of respect for our critical care colleagues and even the nurses who were probably going in the room more, more often than, you know, me or any of the other physicians were. But, you know, it was, it was obviously an honor to help those people out and help the patients out most importantly. But I think having done ICU throughout residency made me very comfortable with, you know, volunteering to go do that from day one. And the Excellent. ICU doctors also equally, because I'd always been around and they'd seen me and they knew me, you know, on a personal level felt fine with giving me, you know, uh, responsibility. Like once I came on, the fellow that was on the team, basically, he got shifted to another team, and I just functioned as their uh, trainee. Thank you, Karthik. Um, so now we're, we're going to move to Dr. Devalopoli, and uh, uh, I want to ask Dr. Devalopoli, who is uh, a relatively recent graduate, kind of a couple things. One is, um, first, like what, like now that you can reflect back, now that you're in current practice, what kind of, how would you, what things would you want out of your training that you may have not gotten because you trained kind of like I did in a more traditional uh, training paradigm. What things do you, do you, you know, whether it be ICU, clinical rotations, more IR, more autonomy types of cases or procedures, what could you, now that you're reflecting back, if you, you know, Monday, you know, morning quarterback, what would you ask or do differently? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, thanks again to you and Sid for um, organizing this and for having me on. Um, such great panelists and uh, Hearing the passion in everyone's voices makes me realize that, you know, this is definitely the future of our field and it's so glad to, you know, so gratifying and glad to hear that. Um, there's a lot of things that I think back about and I think a lot of that's 
actually been said, but I'm gonna I'm gonna rehash on some of it. So the first thing I think about when you know I think about kind of the trajectory of my training and where I am in my career, the most important thing is having more of a clinical background, first and foremost. It's really funny because when I was going through training, the thing that I worried the most about was being technically proficient and being able to actually catheterize a certain vessel or do a certain procedure. And now that I'm out here doing it, and it's my second year doing this, I'm realizing that's not actually the most important thing. It's actually being able to take care of patients. And, and that fundamentally is the biggest thing. And I think it's imperative that our future IRs find ways to incorporate that into their training. And I know you're doing a tremendous service to our field trying to help establish this, this new trend, really. And IR is a very young specialty, so there's growing pains involved for sure. But when I think of specific things, I think, you know, when I think of Karthik's perspective and what he's getting out there training with you, and I think about Nikki at UVA, um, clinic time. I think the concept of a longitudinal clinic is amazing. I think it, it is a pretty low resource activity, and I think it's something that should be able to be incorporated in any program. I think that's invaluable, um, especially when you think about practice building, which I'll touch on in a little bit. Um, specifically with respect to clinic time, more vascular oriented training, okay? I, I think that's a key, key point. I think one of the things that I never realized is how important peripheral arterial disease really is. You know, I was kind of conditioned to think that interventional oncology is kind of the hallmark of what we do as interventional radiologists. and. And it is very important. And some of the you know, techniques and technologies are, are really awesome. And I think a lot of places do a great job exposing their trainees to that. But at the end of the day, you know, the statistics are what they are and you can't argue with math. There's over 20 million Americans with PAD, yet there's only 40,000 plus new cases of HCC every year. So if you're in a typical community setting, especially where I live in the Southeast, you are far more likely to experience a vascular disease patient than you are an interventional oncology patient. And that's the truth of the matter. And I didn't realize that until I got out and I had to actually deal with it. Um, I had some PAD work in training, not a lot, but you know, I felt like I had decent technical training, but that's not what was important. It was actually being able to take care of the patients. And, and why that's important is not only as an ethical thing to take care of patients, but if you're not taking care of patients, then the turf wars and things that you students might have heard about becomes an issue. And what I realized is when I helped establish a clinic and started taking care of patients, turf became less of an issue for me. That wasn't really the concern. Uh, business will come if you take care of patients. And I think that's the most important thing. So having clinically oriented training, peripheral arterial disease training uh, specifically um, is key. And I think ultimately this all comes down to practice building, okay? So when I think about my own attendings, when I was a resident and a fellow, they're actively building service lines. I know you, Dr. V, you're probably thinking about building new service lines. It's happening every day. It's not a unique thing to private practice. People are doing this in academics all the time. And if you think about it, this is a tremendous opportunity to incorporate trainees, residents in the process. And what that ultimately does is it can give a resident a blueprint for how to do this when they're on their own. And I think that's a, that's a key consideration that trainees should have. I think if I were going back in time and asking, you know, attendings on interviews, what, what's important, I'd, I'd ask them about practice building and do you incorporate trainees in the process? And I think you'd be surprised. I think it's a foreign concept and maybe a lot of people haven't thought about it, you know, in the academic setting, but I think more people will. And, um, you know, what I'd like to say related to this is, you know, since we are such a young field, the students listening to this, you are going to change the field. So it's not going to change unless you're inquiring about these new kind of seemingly novel concepts in training. And that's how things will get incorporated. So I think practice building is extremely important. And then finally, the thing that I really wish I had a little bit more of is actually understanding the economics pertaining to IR. And that's probably getting a little bit outside of the scope of this discussion, but I think it's something that you all should keep in the back of your head. I think it's important to understand how we get paid, okay? How do we get paid in a hospital setting? How do we get paid in an outpatient setting? What are the, what are the incentives for diagnostic radiologists? What are the incentives for interventional radiologists? And how does a dynamic in terms of payment influence our ability to build real clinical IR services? And I think, I think that's really important because what 
you know, ultimately what will come of this is by having that knowledge, you as a future IR will be able to better evaluate for yourself what environment you will be successful in actually fulfilling the mission of a fulfilling clinically oriented IR practice. And I think it's important to try to get some of that information. Speaking of which, um, I know that you're opening up a new practice. Congratulations. I know there's, you know, the excitement of building your own entity. Um, what kind of led you down that path uh, to pursue your own kind of separate individual ind independent practice? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's really funny because when I, when I think back to when I was a resident, this was never a consideration for me, you know, kind of in the back of my head was, all right, well, you're going to do IR and one of, you're going to go down one of two paths. You're either going to get a traditional academic job or you're going to get a traditional private practice job where you join a group of radiologists that are usually hospital based. And, you know, I was kind of split on it. And basically, long story short, I decided to go private practice because, you know, kind of my motivations for doing so. And, you know, a lot of, you know, the residents on this panel they, they already know what they're looking for in an IR practice. They're already, they already know what their mission is in IR. I didn't really know that till later on, probably because of, you know, how I was exposed to radiology and kind of the training paradigm that you touched on, which is kind of the old school training paradigm. Well, I came to the realization kind of late that I want to build a practice and I want to have autonomy and I want to develop service lines because to me, this is part of being a clinically oriented IR. And I felt like in my local environment, I was better, better able to do that in private practice. So I ended up in a pretty traditional private group at the time, it was of uh, 18 radiologists, uh, four of us did IR, and you know we staffed a community hospital, with about 350 beds, and um, and you know on paper this is seemingly a good job. I mean we had exposure to a variety of different cases, but what was really kind of lacking for me was the ability to really develop a clinical practice. It's actually really funny when Karthik was talking about you know the old clinic you had, Dr. V. I think about that, and you know I don't even have a clinic, right? So when I wanted to do PAD cases and see patients, you know, I had to find space. I was seeing them in closets. I was seeing them in, you know, support staff offices. I was seeing them in waiting rooms. It was, you know, it was kind of ridiculous, but, but you make it happen. And, you know, I was, I was building up a presence and I was getting, you know, better cases, taking care of patients. My name was getting out there and it got to the point where, I realized that how I want to build my practice is not in line with what my colleagues wanted. And, you know, I think your mileage will vary depending on the group. And I, you know, I think it's hard to make blanket statements in any setting, but all settings. But I think that on the whole, traditional groups, unfortunately, even in the state, don't necessarily value that clinical care. And I think a lot of it gets down to the economics, which is probably should be a webinar in itself. But Basically, I felt like I could not meet my goals in actually developing a practice in a way that I feel is ethical and fulfilling. So I decided to seek other, other ways to do so. And that led me down the road of um, finding mentors. Um, and I realized for myself that in this environment, that would mean going down the OBL path, which for students who don't know, it's an outpatient-based lab. And um, I got introduced to um, a great mentor and friend, Dr. Bill Julian. Uh, he practices down in South Florida and he kind of showed me what you know his practice is all about. He was the first one in the US as an IR to actually do this or of any field. This was back in 2001, he opened his office. And I saw for myself, you know, how powerful that is. And you know, he was a mentor to me who's practicing in the way that I want to practice. So that's pretty much how I ended up down this path. And then I ended up, you know, becoming friends with a cardiologist who had similar goals. And next thing you know, here we are. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I was lucky enough to hear Dr. Julian talk when I was a fellow at the uh, ICID meeting and hearing how he was kind of going through the initial stages, developing his own ex uh, uh, practice and doing kind of quote unquote the right way, seeing patients and, you know, treating them like family. So uh, I uh, kind of echo your statements. Okay, so real quick, I want to go down and now we kind of see that these things are important, right? So, um, Kavi, how do you um, identify that because it's not necessarily transparent like which programs are quote-unquote clinical or truly clinical or, or you know, et cetera. How can we how can you identify that if you interviewed a, a IR residency and I want to hear what Shantanu and and um, and uh, Rocky have to say too. So for the students out there how can they identify such a program? Yeah I, think, I think it's a fantastic know? question. Um, I think the biggest thing I would ask you know first is you know do you, do you have a clinic all right because 
believe it or not, even two years ago, I mean, some places didn't have a clinic. You know? So that's the first thing. And secondly, do your residents go to clinic? I, I think that's that's important. So that's the outpatient side of things. On the inpatient side of things, I would like to know, do you have an admitting service? Okay, do you admit your own patients? All right. And do your attendings round, you know, with your trainees on that service? I think that's how I would start. Uh, Rocky, how would you go about it if you were a medical student right now, finding out or ascertaining this aspect of um, education? So besides what Dr. Devlapuri already said, uh, and uh, other most important point I would say is, it's sort of a shameless plug, but if you have connections in MSc and RFS, you are going to go to their programs to interview eventually, make that strong connections because friends, the residents inside that program will actually give you the honest opinion. Besides asking these questions to the program directors, the attendings who you interview with, the chief resident, you still can get the insider information if you know somebody. For example, if someone is gonna be in that program, I'll, I'll just talk about my program. If they reach out to me, I'm gonna lay them out the real deal because I don't want them to be in some kind of uh, false pretense that when they come to this program that they're going to get and they don't come into that program, you do not want to work with that kind of a person who's going to be unhappy. So to be honest, just because you're all of the way we are built as humans, you want somebody who you can enjoy working with and you, if you give them the real honest answer, they will also uh, find out about that program much better. And having clinic, uh, one thing you can uh, uh, talk about to the, the, the residents that as uh, Karthik mentioned, uh, do they run the clinic? Uh, do the residents have their own continuity clinic? And uh, how often do they have it? And uh, who, who supervises them? Uh, you're not going to be uh, uh, by yourself in the beginning years, but you will need a supervision unless you reach to the level of Karthik, which, which is pretty amazing. Uh, but bottom line, you ask the residents, you ask the junior attendings, you ask the techs in that program. You, when you are in the and there in the program, you're doing the tour of the uh, the angio suite. Just see what the dynamics are. Probably those all things will help. Shantanu, yeah. So this is uh, this is a. Uh, I think I agree with Rocky what he's saying. So the people are catching on. I think when you guys are all um, interviewing and on the interview trail, people are catching on what, what you guys care about, what all the applicants are caring about. So the programs and residents and attendings are, are quickly realizing what the right answers are. And they will give you those, they will feed you those right answers, but that does not mean that that is actually how things are in those programs. So the best way to learn about a program and how clinical they are is, is word of mouth and talk to people that you trust um, at other institutions, at that institution, and um, and hopefully they'll give you the 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 real uh, details about that program. As far as what I consider clinical, um, I consider so a lot of programs give lip service to clinical IR, and there's plenty of programs that are truly clinical, and there, there's a lot that just kind of say they're clinical. And what you need to be looking for is is sort of the program that you get a consult for something like a I don't know, splenorenal shunt, a patient with like hepatic encephalopathy, splenorenal shunt, and the decision is the decision to do a Berto is made not by um, not by GI or hepatology or, or surgery. It's made by the IR interventionalist. That's who should be making the decision, and that is the um, definition of clinical. So that's where you got to go work up the patient, write the consult note, discuss with hepatology, and then decide whether or not you're going to do that procedure or not so that is what I, that, that's an example of sorry sorry go ahead no i think that's that's sort of what i consider clinical um but as far as when you're looking for programs when you're on the interview trail you have to talk to uh people at that program uh friends that you know insiders that you you might have access to yeah i mean i know karthik uh he had stockholm syndrome so that's you know, so I'm not going to ask him uh, about his thoughts, but uh, let's move on. Okay, so um, any other any thoughts uh, on any of this uh, from Siddhant? 
any questions that are burning that we need to answer right now or we can proceed? I think that's perfect. I know Dr. V, you're planning on giving a presentation on really just tying all this together and how there's uh, how we can go as medical students to the end of residency, kind of summarizing our thoughts. And then after this, maybe we can do a formal FAQ if the presenters have some time and uh, go from there. Great. One sec here. All right, Dr. V, you should be the presenter now, so you should be able to share your screen if you want. Um, yeah, go ahead. All right, um, I know it's getting late, so let me kind of navigate this one second here. Can you guys see my screen? We can. Okay, so let's proceed. So this is kind of a, I really appreciate the opportunity and, and it's an honor and privilege, so like I said, to work with the, quite a distinguished uh, group. I mean, two distinguished authors, you can see on the far right, a uh, textbook by Nikki Keith and by Shantan Warpandi. Um, you know, and uh, one head of the MSC, Nikki Keith, I'm glad she was able to make it. Thank you, Minaj Kaja and UVA for allowing her, though it's quite crazy and busy over there, to call in uh, on her call night. Um, and three heads of the SIRFS that I'm lucky enough to and privileged to know quite well. And, uh, you know, Nikki and Karthik were two of the higher uh, tastes of uh, primary operators and taste procedures in our in our history as uh, of a, having a medical student rotation. So, again, it is really an honor and privilege to work with all of you. So, um, so let me just say that VIR is a definitely a clinical and surgically oriented specialty. It's fundamentally different from diagnostic specialties such as either radiology or pathology. And we're seeing that more and more so as the IR residents come out. And we're certainly seeing it as the trainees start to uh, even diverge during their MS4 year, okay? Because we're focused on patient care. I mean, we're doing invasive procedures on people. And as many have said, it's really not, could we? That's a technical question. It's really, should we, all right? And you're working with your hands. So you have to enjoy that. You have to have, like Shantanu said, a degree of stamina to be able to do that. Because you can't give up just because you're tired and you're trying to stop a bleeder. It's life or death at that point. Similar in surgery and procedure-based specialties, it's in terms of lifestyle, workflow issues, and our focus on patients. Now, this is a, a slide from Andy Adams' uh, daughter lecture uh, a considerable amount of time ago. He was the head of the British Society of Interventional Radiology and a very uh, dynamic speaker. But he queried, were we fishing from the wrong pond, i.e., were we selecting medical students who really weren't patient-centered focused, who wanted to kind of the surgical kind of approach and were excited about procedural medicine? And um, in fact, that probably was the case for some time. But now we're definitely seeing a transition of, of, of students who really otherwise would have done neurosurgery or ENT or orthopedics or urology or cardiac surgery or vascular surgery join our specialty. And I think that's been an important paradigm. Now, when I look at escalation of care, certainly as a physician, um, my primary focus and, and our societal focus should be prevention, whether it be prevention of virus, transmission, prevention of diabetes, hypertension, heart attacks, and strokes, really comes down to diet and exercise and lifestyle modifications and screening exams to reduce cancer rates. But then after that, it's really supporting these patients, whether they're having hip pain or joint pain, like with PMNR or physical medicine and lifestyle changes and exercise or weight loss is our next step. And then ultimately, we start to progress to medications where they're pharmacologic adjuncts, right? So we, we need to have that approach in medicine in general. So we start with that. And then finally, we should have this interventional limb, whether it be interventional radiology, vascular interventional radiology, it'd be um, GI, interventional cardiology, interventional palm, whatever it may be, these minimally invasive therapies are, if they're safe, if they're efficacious, and they're durable, and can stand the, the test of time, uh, that should be really a strong option for patients, especially if they have physiologic derangements. And then we can talk about the traditional surgical management, which you should also be aware of, and that includes laparoscopic and open surgical uh, approaches. So all of these are going to be important when you're escalating care. But again, prevention is really should be everyone's primary goal as a physician or someone in the healthcare industry. Now, again, I've uh, heard this a few times tonight, but I think one of the key things is a lot of historically IRs would be like, uh, you know, could we? Yeah, we can stick a needle anywhere. We can open up a vessel anywhere. It's a technical question. It's honestly a very easy question often to answer. But the more challenging question, the more important question is, should we? All right. 
any invasive specialist, whether it be a surgeon or a proceduralist or an interventionalist, we have a moral and ethical responsibility to know this answer or to identify or di find this answer. Because as a clinician, as we are physicians taking care of patients with various diseases, it's imperative that we understand the natural history of the diseases what we are, are dealing with. And that includes the prognosis and the various therapeutic options, including pharmacologic adjuncts and medicines. And my primary role now as a physician, as an interventional doctor, as Karthik said, is in the clinic or in the, on the, in the bedside uh, and being a guidance counselor, helping that patient and their family through their, their struggles and trials and tribulations of dealing with illness. That is my primary role, okay? Not the, the, the high-end procedures we do, not any of that, but really that, guiding them and counseling through their difficult time, okay? So I, um, I was lucky enough to uh, talk to Derek Midleiter, who was, at the, who was initially a resident at the Maine Medical Center and initiated the concept of a resident clinic. And as Karthik said, if you look at the word clinician, the first six letters is clinic. And if we look at Karthik is the one who really uh, pointed this out, just like Shantanu educated me and, and enlightened me about the importance of ICU. Karthik was like, hey, if you look at the surgery residents and how much um, clinic time they spend, 250 to 500 days of clinic. Um, and then UVA was uh, incorporating, Main Medical Center was incorporating it. So Karthik is like, let's develop something of that nature. So again, you as a resident, should be the one pushing your faculty to change the landscape because this is a new training paradigm. You as a medical student should be asking about it and no matter where you go, you should be changing it to, to become this way. And so at our place, our residents do half a day of clinic a week. So it's roughly about 225 days of total clinic during their uh, year, uh, training paradigm. This is Derek Midleiter who developed a concept of resident run clinics. And I was lucky enough to uh, work on a publication on this concept uh, with him, but he is really the driving force behind this. All right, so what is our seven-year training program? And let me talk to the medical students, some of you maybe first and second year. And really the training starts and education starts then. So your first and second year, you really need to focus on anatomy and pathology. That's a foundation of radiology, right? Anatomy and pathology from head to toe. But what's not traditionally taught to radiology and what's really important as an interventional physician is pharmacology, physiology, microbiology, okay? And really need to feel comfortable with the heart, lung, liver, and kidney. Okay, and in the era of stroke therapy, uh, neurology, for heart, lung, liver, kidney, you want to get down very well, okay? When you're a third year, I would argue surgery is probably the most important to, to showcase, to, but internal medicine is also important because we're dealing with sick patients without anesthesia support. Patients who can't tolerate open surgery will come to our clinic and come to our suites. They're going to have ejection fractures diminished, critical aortic stenosis. They're going to have pulmonary arterial hypertension. They're going to have severe portal hypertension or hepatic dysfunction, or ESRD, end-stage renal disease. So these are patients that, again, that internal medicine is going to give you that foundation and understanding during your third year of medical school. Fourth year, this is the first of your seven years, okay? And this is where we're already seeing a transition. And I know it's unfortunate that the fourth year medical students right now have the COVID issue and they can't do a ways, but make the most of it, okay? So what we have advocate, though, for the third and second years that are in the audience in the first years is doing three busy sub-eyes, okay? And during those sub-eyes, I don't want you in the procedure rooms alone. As many of the, uh, the participants said, catheter time is one component of the three Cs, but it's consult time. You need to go to the clinic. You need to spend time on the inpatient consults and seeing and valuing patients in that, in that amalgam, and not just in the procedure at bay, doing procedures, okay? That's important, but as important, if not more important, is the clinic and developing that understanding that how to counsel a patient. Doing a vascular surgery or surgical oncology or transplant surgery, any of those rotations that you may need to do at your parent institute now, or just to get catheter-based technology tech, uh, experience, interventional cardiology, interventional uh, neuroradiology, or endovascular surgery, anything that you can do at your parent institute may be the way to go because of the COVID issue. You may, you're not likely able to do away rotations, but if you can do that, you'll still not lose ground compared to your predecessors the last year or the year before. ICU is critical, MICU or SICU or whatever is really busy and uh, has a lot of sick patients, do that at your parent institute. Cardiology consults, stroke neurology, and then as uh, Shantan just said, get some surgical rotations in, surgonc or vascular surgery, et cetera, to get you ready for that important, very important intern year in surgery. Surgical internship, I think is, um, you know, I you know, initially had my trainees go through medicine, um, and now we've got our first batch, Zayin Billa, who's actually 
doing a surgical internship and that's been invaluable, okay? And I can already see the fundamental difference in their training um, as Zaim has come up and how comfortable he is already in the IR suites, okay? And then having a month of vascular surgery or two, uh, Nikki had done four, which is amazing, um, but at least a month or two of that, surgical oncology and ICU also is really important. And I would look at Faraga Meds, uh, I think he texted everyone, kind of a surgical prelim uh, database that you can use to your advantage. ICU. In our program, I think it's very important to get ICU training during your second year, early and often integrated. You don't want to go as a fifth-year resident and act like a, either glorified radiology uh, doctor or as a medical student. You want to be a senior in the ICU. So monthly we can be our call, uh, so you're getting comfortable with covering consultations as a second-year resident and performing um, procedures. And then uh, two months of IR, I think, is very important every year, PGY2, 3, and 4. So 2, 2, 2, 10 is kind of what we call it. But every year, you should at least have two months. One month is not enough interventional, okay? And the continuity clinic is critical. Your rapture training, half a day a week, no matter what imaging rotation you are, you will maintain your clinical skills that way. You do not want to lose what you've trained so hard to do and what's so important to take good care of patients. All right. So third and fourth year, same thing, continue that clinic. It's so important to see patients and follow them and see what you do well, but more importantly, to learn what you didn't do well. And the only way to get better in a technical field or a procedural field is to see your patients and follow, not in the one month or one post-op, but over time. And we see now our aneurysms in 10, 15 years, they're getting end of late end of leaks and late degeneration aneurysms. In fact, we will change our, par our paradigm. Okay, on how we treat these patients. Many of these may argue we need to go to open, or maybe we need to have longer necks, or maybe we need to do fenestrate kind of drafts. And the only way to learn this is when your patients have to go through this. Then you go, hmm, we could do better. All right. Our residents, uh, I think it's important for you to start developing what Dr. Devilopoli said, Kavi was saying about building your practice. So de generating these talks on disease and service lines, as he said, that you're interested in, whether it be thyroid nodules and you know, thyroid clinic or um, whatever it may be, you want to, or a pain clinic or a spine clinic or per partialities, whatever you're interested in, start to generate those talks so you can kind of grow that knowledge base and also develop that practice uh, before you even go out and train in, in, in the private sector. All right. And then um, we, at the end of our third and early fourth, we have a five month block. So you have a consecutive block. This is half of what traditional IR is trained in, where it's um, uh, most four months of IR and a CCU block. So you get a lot of both intensive care training and technical and clinical skills during this block of five months. Um, your final year, you've uh, got a couple more months of intensive care training. So you're really getting a very strong foundation in the sick as a sick and managing patients, okay? You won't be afraid, as Shantanu had said and others had said. And then one or two months of vascular surgery to kind of over, you know, kind of flip through things and get better. And as the world of stroke has really blossomed, and the number we need to treat is so low, and then proven in functional independence is up to 40% based on numerous randomized control trials that came out in 2015, there is an important uh, kind of social issue that we need to uh, address, and we need to take care of these patients in a very rapid fashion, two million neurons a minute. So we need to train more people in how to do this. And Karthik has three months, and I know um, Rocky Ahuja has done a lot of stroke therapy. Um, so I think that's important also aspect that you should get in training. Uh, and then a combination of stroke and peripheral call, kind of the latter half. But again, that continuity clinic, even though your procedural years, your five and six, it's still very important to, uh, to take care of patients and learn. But most importantly, it's also to develop relationships with patients, which is a very rewarding part of my practice. So seeing my patients, and it's a little bit sad now that I have to do so many telephone visits because of COVID, but I really did enjoy seeing my patients. They were part of my family. And over you know course of years and years, you really get to know them very, very well. And they, you care about them, and they care deeply about you. Uh, final year is mostly kind of a IR um, and INR with stroke and peripheral call. And now, you know, it's a lot of debate, and this is a moving target, but you should look at procedural goals. You shouldn't be so heavily set in a transplant center where you're just doing taste and Y90 and tips and biliary. You should look at cerebral angiography. You should look at peripheral arterial interventions. You should look at, you know, you know, are you getting that kind of broad scope of disease, uh, prostates and, you know, 
uh, bleeding, uh, spine interventions, the musculoskeletal interventions, whether pain procedures, et cetera, that are so prevalent, as Dr. Devila Pulikavi had discussed, those are the common things in the real world. If you're outside of a transplant center, you need to be able to uh, survive and, and provide good quality care to your patients. And many of these patients are undertreated and underserved, and we need to do better as a society of uh, healthcare professionals in taking care of these patients. Now, though we're transforming to an amazing clinical technical specialty, we cannot forget what this is ultimately about. It's about people. And if you start to look at these patients, not as a disease, not as a 72-year-old with uh, care for tips or 72-year-old with uh, diabetes hypertension, but you know them as an individual, as Karthik said, these are parents. Treat, think of grandparents, children, aunts, uncles. Think of them as your family. Like, if you have a family member like this, how would you, uh, you know, treat them and how would you manage them? So uh, most important than, of all of what you can do is have passion for what you do. Um, and you can see that our panel is extremely passionate about what they do. But you need to have compassion for your fellow, fellow human, okay? And you need to have empathy for the condition because they're struggling. They're in pain. They're having, they're, they have the, you know, the word eye of cancer, you know, they, uh, you know on their forehead. They're, that's what they're thinking about. They have other issues. So it's important to empathize with them. It's not just a procedural component. It's really the most important thing is this. So in medicine, the most important thing that we have is the healer-patient relationship. You know, being a teacher is very, you know, very, you know, very um, sacred. Being a religious leader is very sacred. And being a healer, whether it be a physician, uh, Ayurvedic uh, person, whatever it may be, is very important to assist from a societal standpoint. And that cannot be commoditized. And it's so important that we have this, we're blessed to be taking care of people in that fashion. This is my email. Uh, I encourage anyone to shoot me an email. We want to learn more about this stuff and we can even talk offline on the phone about some of this stuff and how to prepare yourself and uh, for training, uh, whether you're a resident or a medical student. Thank you, Dr. Reed. That was an amazing presentation and, and I definitely learned a lot. If we have a few moments and being conscious of the time, um, could we open up for a quick Q&A for our panelists here? I've been receiving a few texts from my colleagues and uh, definitely had a few questions for all the content that was talked about today. Yeah, let's, uh, I, let's, uh, if anyone can stay, we can try to answer questions. I'm willing to stay. If anyone else can, please feel free yeah, to, sure. but if you have to go, we understand. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Emma, uh, do we need to open the Q&A box or how would that work? Yeah, so if you guys can just go to the questions and uh, type in your questions there and we can we can read it out loud. Why don't you guys start uh, asking the questions then? Let's see, one person said other specialties like ortho are talking about doing virtual ways. Has this come up in IR for a ways during COVID? Uh, I'll, I'll try to address that as well as I can. So I think we're going to need some official guidance from APDIR, and I think we're starting to, but it's certainly something that is, uh, you know, I'm certainly thinking about, and um, we are just trying to figure out how to navigate that with HIPAA, et cetera, and whatnot. But um, we're learning about it, and I think um, if you guys have any ideas or suggestions, we'd be certainly willing to learn, listen and learn as a society, you know, how to proceed in this fashion. We do think that... Um, is potentially a viable option. It's hard to replicate the day-to-day -day existence, but it's something better than nothing, so to speak. We have another question here said, um, can you give your general thoughts about dual applying for DR and IR? Yeah, I mean, look, there's, uh, this is my thoughts. It's just challenging, right? Because I think there's only so many interventional spots and we don't know how competitive it will be this year compared to last or the year before. Um, so there is multiple pathways, right, to interventional uh, become an interventional physician. There is an interventional radiologist, a vascular IR. There's the ESIR and one year independent. There's the diagnostic radiology and two year independent. Uh, and then there's obviously the integrated IR DR residency, the IR residency. Um, so if my thoughts are, if their program has uh, independent spots and ESIR spots, it's probably a reasonable approach, or if the program has an established track pattern of getting a, their residents into the conventional fellowships, um, I think those would make sense. But you know, uh, I think um, 
I think it makes sense to do apply just because of the limited number of interventional spots in IR residencies. Uh, I'm curious to see what uh, Shantanu or Rocky or Karthik have to say, or Kavi. Yeah, I am. Um, so I'm actually a huge proponent of, um, I, I get asked this a lot, and I, I, I like to say that if you, um, if you can get into an IRDR spot, integrated IR spot at a very good program, at a clinical program, then absolutely go for it. Um, if, if you are less competitive, um, and you know, be honest with yourself, and there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. If you are less competitive, um, then you absolutely still can do diagnostic radiology, do ESIR, and then reapply to the independent. Um, and in some ways, that might actually be of uh, might be a good thing for you because you have the next four years to build up an application that's stronger. You can st strengthen your application and then shoot for one of those really clinical spots. So uh, my personal experience, I'm an ES. I didn't have the option for IRDR when I was applying, so I had to go through the traditional diagnostic radiology and then ESIR pathway. So I think it's been it's been a you should not sacrifice your radiology training. Um, to go to a, a lesser IR program, I guess is the best way I can put it. So there's nothing wrong with ESIR. You will still become an interventionalist. I think you just need to put in some work and, and build your CV up in your next couple of years, get involved, um, you know, be a leader in your residency, wherever you end up, um, and and build up your resume and then reapply. It's okay if you if you don't get IRDR. Um, yeah, I, I agree. actually think mm -hmm. one of the benefits, you know, say, you know, you dual apply if you go to a program that, you know, you realize didn't have as strong an IR program as you thought. And now, you know, your DR, ESIR, you know, you have a lot more opportunities. You know, we didn't, you know, Miami Vasco, which is a great place, doesn't have an integrated spot, right? There's still that whole opportunity for an independent residency training at one of the most premier places in the country. So I think, you know, knowing these and your options is really important. And like Shantanu said, also being real with, you know, how competitive you think you are. And if you've Feel like you've had a good exposure to a lot of the programs or learn you know how clinical a program really is i think if you feel like you didn't really learn that then maybe dual applying may be beneficial um i'd just like to ask to a question oh sorry about that go for it i apologize no no no, it's all, no worries um i just wanted to add that i agree um with what was said i think you know i obviously didn't train in this paradigm but thinking about the you know pathways present you know i, I would definitely dual apply and you know, clinical training is, is key. And I mean, that's been stressed. I mean, everybody should know that who's listening to this. But the one thing that I do want to state is getting great radiology training is, is extremely important as well. I mean, what's so challenging about training in IR is you got you have to learn all this stuff, including imaging. But the one thing that I want students to understand is now having been on the other side of it, having that kind of knowledge and diagnostic radiology and having that expertise from a practical standpoint is critical because it gives you options in the future in terms of jobs and i want to make sure that, that everybody realizes that um thank thank you for that i had a question actually for one of our students who was struggling with the q a so i figured i'd ask him uh ask for him and it ties into our discussion here so this is from hank bryant he had asked me uh, he wanted to ask you guys actually, what are some questions you'd suggest that students uh, ask during the residency interviews, um, especially given the current situation, to really get an idea of what residency will be uh, like at a, at a given program, uh, such as case diversity and all. So what type of questions would you suggest that, that we, can, you know, we can ask? Yeah, I can take this. So this is, um, this is a really good question. And I think this is, if, if asked appropriately, you can get a lot of information about a program um, in this manner. So the way that I would phrase this question is essentially ask the resident or fellow, or whoever you're talking to, um, run me through your date, like your day in the life of you when you're on IR. And what, what you're really trying to tease out is, you know, do they show up um, and just start doing procedures? Is there no pre -run? What you're trying to see is essentially, are they rounding? Are they running the list? Are they going on the floor and seeing consults? Um, are they, you know, is this a, cons a true consult service or is this kind of like just a technical procedural service? Um, you know, have them ask about clinic time and saying, how do you integrate that in your day to day um, life? So I think if you can ask that question and kind of let them just patiently answer it, you can get a lot of information about the program and how clinical they are. Thank you for that. And um... I also want to ask a follow-up to that too, which is from another student, Tony Risk, 
uh, he had asked me, he said, um, to ask to you guys is, is it a good idea for students to reach out to PDs uh, at this stage to express interest or to ask these questions or should we try to use our connections mostly with the residents and um, you know, non-PDs? Uh, what would be your thoughts on that? I can take this one too, just because I have personal experience with it. Um, so my wife was in Pittsburgh, so I had, uh, I had to be in Pittsburgh. I, I was, I, there was no other option for me. So I actually reached out to the program director here um, almost six months before I even applied and um, I, to kind of inform, uh, inform him of the, the sort of extenuating circumstances. So, and it worked out, obviously it worked out, but um, I, I think if you have a reason to be in a program and if you have a you know, strong desire, if you know mentors or if you know um, people in that program, they seem happy. I think these are very good reasons to why you should reach out and express interest. Um, you should not, I think you should uh, qualify that when you send that email, you should qualify by saying, you know, I, I would be very interested in your program. Um, and please let me know if I can, especially during this time with the whole COVID situation going on and, you know, potentially not being able to do in a way. Um, you should, you should say that, you know, I, I would, I'm very interested in your program and uh, uh, here's my CV. Uh, attach your CV and say, what can I do to, you know, become more competitive or be, you know, optimize my chances at uh, coming to your program. Um, and I think most PDs will look on that favorably. It, it puts you on their radar at the very least. It puts you on their radar. Uh, but if you have a reason, if you if you want to be somewhere, you should definitely reach out to the PD. I, that's my take on it. It worked out for me, and I think it's worked out for people that I've uh, interacted with in the past. Wow, I couldn't agree more either. Uh, reaching out to PDs or the the fellowship directors in our case, as I mean, I, I'm the a living example of that. I reached out for Pete's IR program in my second year because I made my decision at the end of second year that I this is what I want to do. And uh, I reached out to only four programs which I was interested in. And I got interviews in all the four programs, but happened to be selected at that one of the program that I wanted to go. Um, and it's never a wrong thing to do. It's just the approach, uh, as Shantanu mentioned, and uh, they will appreciate that if you're uh, upfront. And at the end of the day, believe it or not, program directors only want people who are ha who are going to be happy in their program and who are going to be upfront and come uh, come up with saying that, hey, I am very interested in your program. So if you have that something in your mind, go for it. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. And um, is our Q and A box working? Uh, I have a few more questions, but I obviously don't want to look at overlook the people who are able to use the Q and A. Yeah, it's working. If you want me to say the next question. Yeah, let's let's try to shuffle it up. I do have more, but we'll try to get some. Q &A. All right, there's a lot of repeats on here, and some things have already been um, addressed. Uh, this student said, "How can rising MTs be competitive applicants with step two being pass fail?" Oh, probably step one, I think. Oh, yeah, sorry, step one. Dr. V, if you want to take a uh, crack at that. Yeah, yeah no, I think that's going to become a challenge. So um, the alternative things you can showcase is like, hey, what is your involvement in the Medical Student Council of SIR? You just showcase your passion for the field. What have you done? Have you set up a symposia? Have you uh, kind of spearheaded an interest group? Have you reached out to undergraduates and uh, pre-medical societies and educated about intervention and got them involved? Um, IR research, um, those are going to be the important things to kind of move things along. Your third year scores, uh, well, you know, I think those are the ways to kind of differentiate yourself uh, because you're right, step one has been a way for us to um, kind of guide us a little bit as kind of a, you know, to kind of triage, so to speak, somewhat. But now if that's going to be gone, that'll be challenging. And then step two, uh, take step two and and that may be now used as a tool. So these are the things that you're going to need to do to kind of uh, aid you in being a competitive applicant. Another question we had is other specialties, especially vascular surgery and cardiology, seem to have embraced simulation training. What role do you see endovascular simulation having in IR residency in the future? Yeah, I mean, so, I, I think that will be certainly utilized. Uh, we have, um, in our facility, we have the Mentis uh, simulator or whatever simulator you can utilize. Um, I think uh, at least for the basic steps, it will certainly be something that is going to be used, whether it be any invasive field, surgical, 
uh, whether doing robotics or laparoscopic or suturing or interventional with catheters and wires. And so the simulator programs are getting better and better as time goes on, and it will be implemented more and more so. No question. So I actually just got a question too, and it seems to tie in um, reasonably well with what we're talking about right now. So we had Alex Arney asked me the question, um, how, how can applicants, and I know this is new territory for all of us, but how can applicants really stand out in virtual interviews? Um, pertaining just to the interview itself, uh, I know the application is, is its own section, but at, at the time of an interview, how can an applicant really stand out? Yeah, I mean, these are great questions. Uh, what I would do is, uh, first of all, I think it'd be nice when we have, we're going to have a program director panel of SIR and virtually, and I think these are questions I would encourage you to ask. But, you know, uh, certainly uh, kind of showcasing your passion and knowledge of maybe that program or having um, being ready to kind of answer questions in kind of test mode will be helpful. But really just, you know, your passion about what you do about IR is going to be the key. And to showcase that and that the program will be a good fit for you in some way um, is important as well. So kind of it's going to be hard, no question. And it's all it's going to be new for both the program directors and the students. So we're both going to learn from this process. But in the same time, I think those are kind of quick ways to to help your cause. I don't know if the others have any ideas because maybe Shantanu, I don't know if you did any virtual um, interviews this year because of COVID. I did. I uh, I did a couple, and it's uh, it's it's challenging for sure. Um, something really random to think about. I, this is completely unrelated, but I had a um, I was sitting with my back to uh, a picture of my wife and I, and randomly kind of became like topic of conversation during my interview. So I don't know. It, it you know it might be something to consider to to have some sort of a personalized thing in the background. Uh, spark a discussion I it, it was challenging it really was um, I think the thing that really helped me um, make the interview experience good was coming in with some sort of a uh, some sort of a story to tell though most of the zoom interviews um, that you may you may be encountering they'll ask you they will want you to talk a lot just because it's easier for them to sort of navigate the interview that way so have a story ready to go as far as how you got to IR I think that's very very important and then add some you know add some personal detail add some um, be prepared to kind of make it into a little bit of a story and it'll consume some time um, but I think that's important this is in a, in a weird way that zoom interviews in some ways allowed me to really showcase my interest in IR more than the the in-person meetings that I had uh, just because I think people were sort of expecting you to talk a little bit more. That was my overall impression of it. So definitely have a meaty story as to why you uh, picked IR, and then you can kind of spend a little bit of time, you know, digging deep into it. All right, we can go to uh, the next question here. Some, a lot of these are repeats. What advice do you have for someone finishing their PGY one year whose DR residency came with a categorical TY year with only two weeks of ICU and zero vascular surgery to get some of that exposure? Shantanu or Rocky would answer that. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I just lost the connection. Sure. Uh, what advice do you have for someone finishing their PGY one year whose DR residency came with a categorical TY year with only two weeks of ICU and zero vascular surgery to get some exposure? Nice. Yeah, I think I think that's okay. You know, that's that's definitely something that, despite me really kind of hammering down on surgery and saying you should do surgery, if if you were in a program that has an integrated transitional, then it was out of your hands. That's okay. Um, I think if you want to get that exposure, um, one thing that I, I tried to do and it just to uh, varying degrees of success was um, my intern year, um, I had a pretty good relationship with the ICU docs in one of the ICUs in the trauma ICU. And um, I, I would go in on the weekends um, when I knew that when I knew that they were sort of short staffed or if there was a resident on holiday or something. I would go in and just kind of spend a weekend or two um, helping out in the ICU that way. 
So um, if you are staying at the same program that you did your um, that you did your transitional year in, then you should absolutely just reach out to your ICU and say, "Can I can I come in on the weekends and you know just spend a couple weekends um, here and there as much as you can, as much as your sort of your schedule allows." But um, that is a really nice way to kind of get exposed. Um, and it, even two days, you know, just a weekend, that's a lot of time. It really is. You know, that's twelve hours or uh, twelve hours each day, and that might amount to a ton of good experience and it, that adds up over time. So there's definitely ways you can kind of get that exposure. As far as vascular surgery goes, um, I absolutely had to beg my PD to, to give me extra vascular surgery experience. And it worked out. Um, it, it really is all about you approaching your PD and saying, this is what's important to me. I really want this. I'm not going to neglect my DR duties, but at the same time, this is what I feel is important for myself. And I think any, any good PD should find a way to make that happen. Um, you have to be creative. You, you have to kind of work with your program director and your your sort of DR schedule, but there's very, very creative ways you can get that exposure. So just because you didn't get an intern year does not mean it's all lost and done. Uh, you just got to work for it. And just to chime in more on that, uh, besides what he already said, remember the fact that I told you guys when you are especially on IR or uh, even on DR, you're on night call or something like that. I understand it's going to be extremely busy, but there's there are times when you would see the patient, uh, the uh, the imaging uh, that will require some kind of an intervention. So you personally can reach out to your own uh, IR docs as well, just to run the case by them, and they will give you an idea. And I understand that's not as good as like hands-on experience, but it will still keep you in the loop of how the thought process works. And uh, even besides that, uh, remember the thing that I told you about when you are on, on IR, go to ICU. Uh, that five minutes of your time that you spent with that patient and, and the team, you will learn a lot. So just keep up and, and it, it just will work out. This is kind of a hard question here. What percentage of integrated programs provide enough stroke training for certification? Yeah, so there's a link on the uh, RFS website. It's under professional development. It actually breaks down the block rotations. You can email me offline and uh, I could kind of get you to in touch with that. So we can go over that. And, and uh, we're to continue to generate a little bit more of that. Here's my email. So I can help you answer that for you. Awesome. Um, are there, uh, well, I guess at this point, if we're all uh, good, I'm glad we were able to answer so many of these questions. I think this was an excellent webinar and I can say for all of us med students, uh, thank you to the panelists, um, every single one. Um, we appreciate you taking your time. We appreciate you coming on um, and we appreciate you sharing us your wisdom about IR and how we can go about it. Um, it means a lot to us, so we do really appreciate that. Thank you so much also for everyone who came, uh, all the attendees, all the wonderful questions. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, fortunately, there were not too many technical glitches I, and, and uh, the night went smoothly. So thank you everyone who came and I guess we'll go ahead and conclude the webinar. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Bye, you guys. Thank you, everyone. Great job. Take Thanks care. a lot. Appreciate it.